This program is starting now. It's called Fiduciary Duties. What are they and who has them? It's an hour-long program. My name is Bill Short. On your screen, you should see the PowerPoint presentation in the center of your screen. That would take up most of it. Uh, there should be a small box, the bottom right-hand side with a video feed with me. No mask, yay. On the left side of the menu, if you have any questions, there's a questions and icon. You can type all of your questions there and go ahead and do that as the program goes forward. But we're going to hold responding to the questions until I get through the materials. I uh, hope about 50 minutes and then be able to answer those questions. So I'll, I'll address those questions at the end of the seminar. CMCA credits are automatically generated once the webinar hosting site provides an attendance confirmation report, and that will be sent via email within 48 hours following the webinar. These credits are not transferable. Uh, if you have any questions about those credits, please email education at altitude.law or call our coordinator, Sean Sanders, directly. His telephone number is 03-991-2076. Yeah, so again, if you have any questions about those CMCA certificates. So now we'll jump in. Welcome aboard. Um, I'm understanding there's almost 250 people here. So maybe there'll be a lot of questions. Maybe there'll be none. Um, I appreciate the interest. I hope I can uh, be helpful. So here on the screen, I've gravitated to the first one just to get through what I hope uh, we will accomplish here. Like I said, it's a pretty big topic. Uh, and these screens are full of material. Uh, I'll do my very best. I think it's hard. I think people get worried about, you know, what is a fiduciary? And so I hope to get through that. It's different depending on what state you're in and what statutes and what cases and, and that sort of thing are applicable. And there's more than one standard. Uh, goal here is not to get you hung up on the legal part of it, but to explain what the standard of conduct is. I mean, what, what does it take to meet this uh, standard? What, what can you do? How can you protect yourself? And finally, uh, or I should say next, to, to discuss best practices, ideas for how you as either managers or board members can go ahead and fulfill those uh, duties, again, in the uh, community association setting. Finally, right before the question and answer uh, section, I hope to discuss a few recurring scenarios that I've seen over the years where there's a contention that someone has not met fiduciary duties and how you can kind of work through some of those problems. Once again, go ahead and type those questions when and as you have them. Uh, we'll take them up in order at the end of the program. All right. So the definition which we find in the Colorado jury instructions, that's a, a book of different jury instructions for trials that go to a a jury as opposed to the court, but the court would follow it, has this quoted language. And the case law that follows that, and it also follows some of the statutes, talks about whenever someone is in this position of having power to do something over another. Uh, the examples other than, of course, in the community association setting are a partner as it relates to a partnership. Uh, for me, to a client, I've got fiduciary obligations, an agent to a principal. So in any principal agent relationship, that's going to include a community association manager to the HOA. Uh, the board member has a duty to the association, a fiduciary duty. Another example, and I don't have it on the screen, but examples, if, if you were the trustee of a trust, that is a fiduciary. All right. Give me some more specifics. Expanding on the definition, the idea is that this fiduciary must act with the utmost good faith and loyalty for the benefit of the association or the benefited party if it's someone other than an association. That means setting aside what are your own personal goals, agendas, preferences, financial incentives, incentives, excuse me, and acting for the benefit of the other. Again, this fiduciary duty is one of the highest duties in the law, so it is um, uh, it's significant. 
and it should not be discounted. But that is, I think, daunting for some people. And I guess that's why there's 250 people on this seminar. But it's not an absolute duty. You're not expected to be per perfect. I know I'm not perfect, and I'm sure none of you are. But it's a pain. All right, here's how. A lot of times the conversations that you'll see in articles or in case law or in statutes about the fiduciary duty expand on it by talking about the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience. So on the screen is the first one. Duty of care, you've probably heard. We all have a duty of care just out in the world, regardless of business relationships or regardless of contracts or regardless of statutes, we have to act responsibly in a non-negligent manner. That's your duty of care to act reasonably. So the duty of care, and as it relates to the board member or manager in the community association setting, is to act responsibly, to act in good faith, meaning not in a punitive way, uh, and then to do so relying upon information and facts that is reasonably developed, meaning not just taking unreliable information or untested information, but develop information that you think has some basis of quality such that it is appropriate to rely upon. The second one is this duty of loyalty. That's again back to this notion of working for the benefit of either as it relates to the HOA, the manager's got to work for the benefit of the, of the association as a whole, it's got to be responsive to the board, uh, not to set, uh, act in the manager's own interest or the management company's own interest. The board member has to act for the overall organization's benefit and not to line that board member's pockets or to do things that benefit the board member as opposed to the association as a whole. So that's the loyalty part of it, faithful loyal, acting for the organization, not for your own benefit. A subset of that is in that paragraph about loyalty is if you've got information known to the director or the manager, which may affect the association's business or operations, you have a duty to disclose it. So you can't have reason to think that a course of action may not be the best idea. And we'll get into some examples later on. Uh, and, and not hold, and, and excuse me, and you should not hold that information back. You need to disclose it so that people can realize that either your opinion about something or the information that you have about a problem or a project or a task is not good information or maybe should be questioned. The last one is this duty of obedience. That means following a number of different things that are applicable to community association setting. That includes statutes. That includes the governing documents. Again, we'll speak about this in a little more detail, but it also means decisions. There may come a time where either a board member or a manager has discussed and has a personal position about a decision that has been reached by the organization, the HOA, and you don't like it. You're not happy with it. Well, the decision has been made and you have to, uh, the obligation to go ahead and follow that. That's the duty of obedience. If you don't like it, you register that as your vote. If you really don't like it, you resign or you quit, but you don't undermine those decisions. You do have the duty of obedience to follow what has been required by prior decisions or by the documents. All right, now's where you're all gonna get nervous. Where, what are some of the topical areas where board members and managers have responsibilities? I'm not gonna spend too, too much time here. Like I said, this is a fairly big topic. Uh, I used to teach a class for the Colorado Association of Nonprofits. It was an all-day training session for board members. A lot of our classes here at Altitude Community Law include some of the, you know, getting into the weeds on what, how do you fulfill your responsibilities. But here on the screen are some of the bigger topical areas where you have to go ahead and exercise decision-making, exercise fiduciary duties, fulfill those fiduciary duties. Now, the first one says legal. Well, you're not lawyers, that's okay, rely on lawyers. Financial is the next one. Okay, I'm not an accountant, that's okay. Get good financial statements and consult with people who know about it. It's not that it's all on you, but there are these topical areas where you can't just show up at a meeting and talk it through and forget about some of the important big picture issues that are confronted, confronting excuse me, the association. And so that gets into selection of staff, continuity. What I mean by that is 
you know, if you're going to resign, who's a, a, a good person to nominate as the next board member or the next manager? Decision making and policies, making sure those policies are adopted and followed. Public relations and communications, that's a huge issue in the HOA setting. I think transparency is, is increasingly something that we realize has to be done and it, it's, it's demanding. But uh, is necessary, and I think that's one of the responsibilities of any board member or manager is to get get the news out there, and then monitoring and evaluation. Okay, you've implemented something; you can't just let it go. You got to go back and follow along, make sure it's being fulfilled properly, and evaluate whether you're being successful or unsuccessful on this course of action, budget, decision, project, whatever that you've implemented. So. We talked, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna cover all of those and go back to that one screen. I mean, these are some of the topical areas. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but examples now onto the next screen where it says at the top legal duties, there's federal statutes, fed, fair housing, there's state statutes like the Colorado Constitution Ownership Act. There's local statutes. There may be some local law about towing, that sort of thing. So, you know, in, in the town or the county in which you're located. Legal duties are also complying with the governing documents. This is going to include the declaration. It's going to include the bylaws. It's going to include any governance policies, contracts that have been entered into by the association concerning what either management or construction or hiring of vendors. And then the common law. The common law is cases and decisions that have been developed through disputes and end up in published court decisions affecting how duties are fulfilled fiduciary duties or HOA duties or manager duties. That's the case law. Those are the different types of legal duties. Oh, and by the way, make sure the association is still properly incorporated, a good standing, et cetera. All right, financial. Some of the financial duties are uh, making sure that the funds are used well. In other words, not just adopting the budget, but following and make sure that expenditures are appropriate. Review and approve the budget review periodic financial statements, and you have to be able to understand them. Uh, if you don't, you can get educated online, but you can't just be accepting at face value financial statements or not understanding them. I don't think anyone is fulfilling their fiduciary duties if they glaze over when they look at financial statements, whether they're balance sheets, income and expense statements, general ledger, if you get into that. Uh, accountability means, I mean, just that, that making sure the funds are properly used, Planning for future financial needs, for example, setting aside for reserves, uh, audits where necessary. You know, a lot of folks don't realize that their uh, governing documents may require an annual audit. And that's a good way to make sure that things are being looked at by someone who may have more experience with these types of things than each of you. All right. Monitoring and evaluation. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I mean, that's just that overall kind of business aspect of not turning things loose and failing to follow up on them. So all of these different, it's kind of checklists, a follow up, monitoring the people and the operations and the results. All right. So Kiowa, the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act has very specific definitions about what are the responsibilities of members of the board of directors. The first definition that you have on the screen is when the community is still under declarant control so that the appointed officers and directors are essentially employees or affiliates of the developer. In that case, excuse me, those directors, it says, have fiduciary duties to the unit owners. This is because the developer's got so much control over everything before it's been turned over. So then one would ask, well, why is it that this second definition, if not appointed by the declarant, how come it doesn't have the word fiduciary in there? And that is a little bit of an uncertainty in the statute. And yet the case law that interprets some of these statutes still holds to the fiduciary type of duty. That second definition talks about you won't be liable as long as you've, as a board member, in the performance of your duties, unless you've acted in a willful and wanton manner. We'll get back to that in a minute. That second definition is known as a qualified immunity. What that means is you're not absolutely immune from getting sued as a board member that's not appointed by the declarant. It's a qualified immunity. That means that if someone does decide to file a lawsuit, it will be filed 
but it makes the likely outcome of the lawsuit more favorable as long as that person has acted responsibly and has fulfilled some of the other uh, details we talked about before. Again, though, back to that second definition, what does this mean? You're not going to be liable unless you act in a willful or wanton manner. So we're now on the screen that says willful, wanton, what? This is a statutory definition of willful and wanton conduct. It comes from the Colorado statute on punitive or exemplary damages. And so it refers to conduct which is purposely committed, which you must have realized was dangerous or heedless, done recklessly without regard to consequences or, with, or of the rights and safety of others. An example I've seen come up in the HOA setting where that was, in fact, it was a case I was involved in some years ago, was a situation where the board and manager did not have much in the way of funding. They couldn't get special assessments imposed. And the allegation was that there was willful and wanton conduct and therefore no immunity for the board members because they had failed to fund repairs and maintenance and things were falling apart. That's the type of thing where someone might make that allegation and there may not be that qualified immunity. Willful and wanton conduct in all the case law construing these statutes means it's conduct beyond mere irresponsibility, mere negligence, mere unreasonableness. It's an, it's an enhanced, an aggravated form of conduct. So that standard, if that's what your conduct gets measured by, is going to make it easier for you to be free from legal liability for a decision. But again, as I say here on that third bullet point, while that, that, that qualified immunity suggests a duty which is less than a fiduciary duty, that statute's been on the books for uh, many, many years. Nevertheless, there's been case law following that in Colorado, published cases, which means they can be relied upon by other courts, and they generally hold to and, and, and speak to the fiduciary nature of your duties going forward. All right, so what do you do? In addition to Kiowa, the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act, an applicable statute is the Colorado Revised Nonprofit Code. Virtually all HOAs are incorporated as nonprofit corporations. And that statute has a specific provision that talks about how directors and officers can fulfill their duties. And then we'll get onto it a little later on. Also, how they can be um, determined not to be liable. So I think it's worth having a little discussion about that. Hopefully it'll give you a little more comfort or else just a little more legalese for today about what it is to fulfill a fiduciary duty. And it sounds a lot like what I've already discussed before. You discharge your duties in good faith and then B, with the care an ordinarily prudent person in a like position would exercise under similar circumstances. And then last, in the best interests uh, of the nonprofit corporation. So that's that duty of loyalty we talked about before. Let's look at that second sentence. Ordinarily prudent person means that you don't have to be a specialist or you don't have to be an expert in, in what you're doing. You need to be what they call it, the, just the reasonable person ordinarily, not excessive, not below normal, average. Prudent means careful. You got to be reckless. You have to be informed in a like position under similar circumstances. What that means is there's no cookie cutter result that, well, someone else did it over here this way. So therefore, if I did exactly the same thing they did, then I'm automatically fulfilled my fiduciary duty. It's all fact specific about how much did you know? How much information did you have? How much danger was there? How much risk was there? How much research was done? And was it a good decision? So that's a very sort of fact intensive inquiry, that definition B that's here on the screen. All right. So, I'm comparing here the language that I had in the first few slides about duty of care, loyalty, and obedience with these statutory definitions. And essentially, that duty of care, act like an ordinarily prudent person. The duty of loyalty, act in the best interest of the organization, not in fulfillment of your own personal agenda or your own interests. 
and then the duty of obedience and following the requirements, the mandatory requirements of statutes, governing documents, and organizational decisions. We're going to get into a little later on the mandatory versus discretionary part of it. Um, the duty of obedience relates to what's mandatory. So, wow, Bill Short just scared me here with all this legalese and all this craziness. How am I possibly supposed to do this? The pay scale isn't great for volunteer directors. Why should I even do this? Please do it because you're not alone on an island here trying to get all this done. In the Colorado Revised Nonprofit Code, I gave you that on that previous screen, what are the basic obligations? Here is another provision from the same statute, the Nonprofit Code, about how you can collaborate and rely upon others to fulfill your fiduciary duties. And so just go ahead and look at that screen for a minute. So let's look at A. Let's assume that you're a director and there's a board of five and there's a construction issue that's come up uh, about you know, what to do or what to spend or how to repair the streets or how to repair the decks or something like that. But you're really clueless about construction. But there's a board member who used to be a contractor or used to be a paver. Well, you can rely upon that other board member or officer or vice president, or if there's employee, you don't typically have employees in, in an HOA, but let's say the, the community manager you have been doing this for years and years and has lots of good experience about construction or paving or whatever is the applicable topic. So the board member can rely upon that person if that board member reasonably believes that this other person, be it a manager or a fellow board member, is a reliable person and has some competence in that area. Item B, that's why altitude community of law exists, which is, this is a complicated area. I'm not pretending it isn't. These statutes, Kiowa, all these complicated issues about how to manage an HOA, go ahead and consult legal counsel. That's what we're here for. We're here to help. Public accountant, again, if you're not certain about the financial statements or if you're not comfortable with what you're reading or what you're understanding or you want to delve a little deeper into what should be the finances or the future course of action for the association in terms of future budgeting, special assessments, that sort of thing, then go ahead and consult a public accountant. Get an audit. If You may have to get one anyways if it's, if, if it's mandated by your governing documents. D is kind of a catch-all. Example is um, we see a lot in the sort of the fair housing arena, uh, all these issues now about, you know, emotional support animals. Well, what if there's some person who's out there who knows a lot about emotional support animals, is not one of the directors or officers, is not an attorney, although we know a little bit about this topic, not a public accountant. There's some other consultant who knows about emotional support animals or knows about who knows what swimming pools, right? As long as you reasonably believe that person or that organization has got some level of reliability and competence, you can rely upon them. And then the other and last one is a committee. Let's say you've got a large task that you're undertaking for the organization uh, about moving forward, about to build or renovate a, a clubhouse or that sort of thing. You have a study group, you get some volunteers, you get a committee, you get them on, on and get them to report to the board. And it, it's got people on it who've been studying it in a lot more detail than you have. You can rely on that committee. Again, once again, if you think they, ha they deserve the confidence that you've given them uh, in the project that's been assigned to them. All right. So takeaways. Go ahead and get the information from outsiders. Don't just sit there in your board uh, meeting and say, we want to make a decision. We got to make a decision. We got to move on and get to the next agenda item. Seek. And if it's going to take another meeting, get, obtain, and then review information from outsiders to help to make the more complicated or the more difficult decision. That is not only a good way to make decisions, but it also is a good way to protect yourself because that is what the law says you're entitled to do.
again, you have to have some reason to believe that the person you're relying upon or the information you're relying upon is reliable. If it's just some bid from some vendor and you have no idea about the vendor's qualifications, licensing, or that sort of thing, maybe that isn't acting reasonably. Just taking something at face value isn't sufficient. So at some level, it's going to be a sliding scale. Less for a simple situation, more due diligence for a more complicated or expensive or risky undertaking. You have to do some sort of due diligence. Who is this person? Validate, you know, get references. Make sure they're licensed. Test the information. Bring them in. Ask them if they've done similar projects. You know, let's say it's construction or let's say it's repair. Ask tough questions. Ask them if they've had, you know, if they've been sued. Ask them if they've ever had declared bankruptcy. Those sorts of things. Don't just accept everything at face value. Again, this last point is if for some reason you have knowledge from your personal life or just because you heard something or you read something in the newspaper that the vendor or this other entity that you're going to be engaging in has got a bad business record, you've got to disclose that to your other board members. And then you can't be relying upon that or else you've got to test and make sure or make sure you've t- uh, created additional protection so that you can use this vendor that has a bad business record. Maybe they've turned it, their, their uh, business around and they're doing just fine now. But you have to check on that. You can't just accept something and you have to disclose that information to everybody. So this fiduciary duty, who, who do you owe it to? This is where I think there's a great amount of confusion among, frankly, even other lawyers who come after HOAs and HOA board members. I see this a lot. Your duty is to the organization as a whole, to the entire organization, not to any one owner. It really is impossible for a director or a manager to owe a fiduciary duty to any one owner because that invariably places that single owners interest in conflict with the others. Another owner, an example would be, you know, sort of the barking dog, right? Let's say it's an emotional support animal and they're entitled to have it. And owner A says, you know, I told you this dog is barking for my neighbor and you didn't go after owner B and kick that person out or kick that dog out. Well, wait a minute, you owe, you owe a duty to owner B as well. So remember that when you get into these, um, disputes that tend to arise where someone thinks that you're supposed to be taking care of them, so to speak. You're not out there to take care of any one unit owner. You're out there to take care of everybody's interests. And guess what? That's a difficult and sometimes complicated balancing act. So practice tip, step back. Um, Don't get involved in the emotions or the reactionary position that everyone seems to find themselves in. I mean, what I've noticed over the past few years is everyone wants things immediately. There's a lot more activist generation coming on board now, and it's very easy for all of us in any kind of setting, uh, personal, business, legal, HOA, to get wrapped up uh, in the situation. Step back. Don't let the emotions take over. Don't be reactionary. Be proactive. Consult with your other board members. You know, the group decision is a lot better than you doing it on your own. I don't think I've got a particular slide about this. I haven't mentioned this, but I do want to mention it now. You, and this is for the board members, not for the managers per se, but guidance for the managers if they have a board that is uh, uh, not necessarily acting as a group. The board acts as a group. No one board member has any authority or any power to by themselves speak for the entire organization. That's not appropriate. The group makes a decision and the group should make decisions in meetings or by uh, unanimous consent to action by email. But you don't want lone rangers. Lone rangers are trouble. And if you have lone rangers, you got to corral them. And you have to make sure that the board acts as a group. That not only protects the decision you make, but it also makes sure that you act consistently. Because if one board member says one thing and another board member says another, you've created conflict internally, and you've also created inconsistency for the organization themselves. Board members should act as a group. They should consult their other board members. They should not try and lead by example and be out in front of the rest of the board. 
the practice tip that's at the bottom of this screen talks about consistency. There is a way to be consistent. We'll get into this a little later on when we talk about the documents that you need to be familiar with. Most of the time, similar circumstances should lead to a relatively similar decision. In other words, if someone makes a submittal for some sort of architectural review and this type of siding has been approved before and it's the same contractor, same type of siding, generally speaking, unless there's some differences that you should get the same result. If it was approved before, it should be approved again. If it was rejected before, it should be rejected again. But always there are circumstances where the situation is different and it's going to lead to a different outcome. That's okay. If that's the right decision and you're going to depart from a pattern or a, a practice and you're going to be going a different direction on whatever the decision is made, how much you're funding, how much you're building, what you approve or disapprove architecturally, that's fine. But put the reasons in writing because one of the things I find in my world is these problems surface months, sometimes years later. Board members have come and gone. There's a decision that's been made. It's given rise to a lawsuit. Why was this decision made? Document it in the minutes or in a letter to the owner. If there's some sort of dispute between owners or an architectural review application and shooting the owner down, set forth your reasons in writing. That's going to help you and the organization to remember and then justify the decision what was which was made especially when it's a decision when you're going a different direction than you had been before. It's fine to be acting inconsistently if the facts justify it. But if you're all over the place and acting inconsistently without any rhyme or reason, that's arbitrary and capricious behavior, meaning it's without basis in fact. It doesn't make any sense. There isn't really any justifiable policy for why you're changing it. And that's where you're going to get yourself or your organization in trouble. Again, not a particular slide on that one, but it, it flows from this uh, tip about acting consistently whenever possible. All right, let's have a new slide. I mentioned before about this duty of obedience, and I want to talk here about where board members do have discretion and where they don't. An example here is if you've got a statute or something that's in the declaration some people call it the CCNRs, the covenants, or if it's in a contract, or if it's in one of your mandatory governance policies that the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act mandates that associations have an effect. There's several of them. If that policy, if that governing document, if that statute, if that contract has language that is mandatory, there's no discretion. There's no decision to be made. You got to do what you got to do. That's part of the duty of obedience. Follow what is required in the documents. There is an obligation to do what is mandated. You can't depart from that. I give a couple of examples. I'm not going to speak to those, but that's what uh, happens. By the way, I have seen this last one. The board will conduct an audit on an annual basis where there's board members that don't realize that their declaration, which is 30 or 40 or 50 pages long, has something in it about shall conduct an audit on an annual basis. And they haven't because they didn't want to or because they didn't realize it or they just didn't have the funds. Well, sorry, shall means shall, no discretion. All right, discretionary authority is just exactly where you're gonna be protected by following the duties that I talked about before where you're gonna be making these tough decisions. As long as you go through the process and the practices we've described here, you're gonna be fine. That's where you have language that may or shall consider something or depending on the circumstances. All right, you've got some wiggle room there. That's your exercise of discretion. What we trial lawyers call that is the business judgment rule. It comes from the for-profit corporate world and it basically means that you're not gonna get second guessed as long as you followed the proper procedures in the right manner. And it's, again, it stems from the language that we've been discussing before from Kiowa and from the Nonprofit Act about how you go ahead and fulfill your duties. For us trial lawyers, and when you have these cases, it's called the business judgment rule. So the first case that's on this screen entitled business judgment rule is one of the earlier ones. 
it has been cited many times in HOA cases since then. And it had to do in that case with uh, the construction of improvements in a real estate development. And the theory is that you're the ones that are getting uh, not paid anything to make very tough decisions. And that you have considered all these decisions and you've gone through the process and an outsider who objects to your decision cannot just go to court and get an, a different answer. That the courts aren't really there to second guess or to sit as a second board of directors to make the decisions again. And so if these, these directors have reasonably and honestly exercised their judgment and fulfilled their duties, then they're not going to second guess. And you're gonna, your decision is going to be upheld. And there won't be any liability either for the organization uh, as a whole or any director if they get sued. The case below that one, the Lorch Wilson case, is a case that I tried years and years ago and went up on appeal. And, and it was the same idea. And I'm not going to get into the details of the case, but basically it was a more laissez-faire board. It was not aggressively enforcing the covenants. It was trying to help a, a unit owner, a homeowner, resolve a dispute with a developer who was still on site. They had all these warranty claims and construction claims about what could or shouldn't be done. And the unit owner said, you got to do this and you got to fiduciary duty. And the home builder called Colorado Homes was saying, hey, HOA, you got to protect me here. This homeowner's really mad at me. And they got into a real kerfuffle. And it, it, the board was determined to have exercised good faith decisions in trying a sort of, they, they basically tried a rapport to try and get these two to, to, to solve their problems without sort of scratching and clawing and biting at each other. And the board was found, the organization was found to not be responsible because they had acted reasonably and they had acted in good faith. And so that's what you see from the cases, generally speaking, for these discretionary decisions. The courts don't want to go and remake the decision for you. All right. So good news and bad news. I've been prattling on about what all the law is here. And the, the outcome is that it is never going to be so absolutely clear that it can get a lawsuit thrown out against the board or excuse me, the association or a board member if they're named. These, the inquiry about whether duties have been fulfilled and you've acted in good faith and loyal, loyalty and in obedience and you know ac exercising discretion reasonably, it's very fact intensive. And the courts are going to say, I can't tell on just a written motion to throw the lawsuit out whether you did or didn't satisfy that. It's I got to sit down and have a hearing or a full blown trial. So the tendency is that these cases will be filed. They're not going to get resolved right away in your favor. I know that's frustrating, but that's just how it is. Our, our judicial system guarantees everybody their day in court. And that generally means it's pretty hard on something that's fact intensive to get it thrown out on the front end. Well, shucks, I'm a director. I don't like that. I may get sued. I don't need to get sued. What? How am I protected? If the, you know, the, the big ugly happens and there is a lawsuit. Well, we haven't mentioned the statutes here. You don't need to know the statutes, but under the Colorado Nonprofit Code and also in your declarations, and it's probably going to also be in your bylaws, there is indemnification, meaning the association is going to hold harmless, is going to protect, is going to pay for anything that happens from the good faith actions of a director. Okay, great. How's that get fulfilled? Well, if the association has to write a check to repay the director's legal fees, that's how it's supposed to work. How it generally is fulfilled is that the association will have a director's and officers, it's called DNO, liability insurance policy. If you're a board member, you want to have one of those. That's going to protect not only the organization, but also the, the board members from the expenses of these lawsuits. So practice pointer, make sure they got a good DNO policy in effect. I'm now going to pivot to two or three examples of where I see uh, recurring issues where someone says that because of the outcome uh, was adverse to one person or another, 
that they claim that there's a breach of fiduciary duty, architectural control disputes. So let's just read that screen together for a minute and we'll circle back to that. Some boards themselves in smaller organizations act as sort of the architectural control committee or ACC. Others will have a separate committee which again is working under the tutelage of the board. And by the way, they're protected too. Committee members are protected too by the same business judgment rule uh, and, and, and the same protections that arise in the nonprofit code. But regardless of whether it's a committee or whether it's the board making these decisions, this is a real hot button area because, you know, people have spent a lot of money for their home and they tend to want to do what they want to do. And they don't recognize that they're living in a, a common interest community where there's other interests, not just their own, but they feel that their home is their castle. So if you're going to be sub, uh, uh, considering these submittals, and especially when it's more complicated, it's not just installing a window, but it's a, a major re-roofing project or something else. Make sure that the submittals are detailed and specific. I had a case years ago where literally the Architectural Control Committee approved a, I think it was a 30,000 square foot barn on a horsey property, kind of single family. And it was on a napkin. It literally was on a napkin and the person scratched it out. And what happened was they had uh, view corridors and height restrictions and the detail on the napkin didn't say how high or low was this barn to be and it was so high because it was built up on a hill it, it interrupted with the view corridor so no barns on napkins folks so it should be detailed and specific so there's no doubt about what is approved or rejected it should say that once the, something is approved that what is to be constructed should not depart from what is approved that often happens it gets approved and then they go build something else. So you got to check back through it. But when making those decisions, that is the classic discretionary powers that you have. It's not mandatory. You can choose. I mean, if there's that example, if it has to be 2000 square feet, it says shall, you can't approve something that's a thousand. But when it relates to the application of architectural control guidelines for a given submittal, you're not acting in a fiduciary capacity there. You're using this business judgment rule, looking at the building restrictions, looking at the architectural guidelines and use restrictions that may exist in the governing documents or ACC guidelines and follow those. So whether you approve it, reject it, conditionally approve, conditionally object, or seek more information, that's all that classic exercise of discretionary authority for which you're going to have more rather than less protection. All right. Next example, developer issues. So this is the situation where a community is being built out or a new phase of a community is being built out and the community is slowly being turned over from control by the developer who owned all the property and started to sell some of the units and the unit owners, the end users are becoming now members of the board of directors. So if it's a board of five, it was all five developer, slowly, slowly but surely because of the uh, transition or the turnover process, more and more of the unit owners are becoming board members. This is a very critical time in many HOAs. And if you are in a community that's going through this transition or turnover phase, you do need to be paying attention. Number one, the Kiowa statute has a long list of things that must be turned over to the association so you can kind of figure out what you got. It's the bank records. It's the governing documents. It's all the, the funds. And you also, one of the most important things is a transition audit. And basically at developer expense, no expense to the association, at developer expense, an audit is done and it reports on all the finances and all the funds that have been utilized and how they've been expended by the developer. And then it co comes into the new board, the owner controlled board's lap. You got to make sure that the money that they may have collected was properly spent. You also have to make sure, and this is a frequent problem, that the developer was charging themselves and paying assessments. When the assessment obligation gets triggered, they need to pay assessments. And frequently that doesn't happen. So again, the audit is paid for by the developer. It's a very critical document. Other things they have to turn over are construction drawings and, and uh, warranties and that sort of thing. 
The other thing that should be done is, has this place been built properly? And obviously there's a whole realm of construction defect litigation and that sort of thing. This is where a new board should be making sure there are warranties, whether they're warranties for the unit owner houses themselves, that's not directly the association's responsibility, but it's one of them, but warranties for the common areas and common elements. If there's a pool, if there's a clubhouse, that sort of thing, check on those warranties. And then at some point, you need to have somebody looking at and inspecting whether this has been built properly. You know, has, has the pavement been installed properly, the sidewalks? Get, hire or either a reserve engineer or a construction person uh, to look at these things because you only have two years from when you knew or should have known that there was a problem to commence litigation against the responsible party. So that's that whole developer issue thing. And I think that's where uh, the, the, these fiduciary duties come into play. And what you don't want is to have come on board. OK, we're great. The community looks good. I'm not going to do anything. It's all fine and good. And then you wait two or three years and the owners come to you and say, where's the transition audit? And how come you weren't taking care of these construction problems? All right. Wait a minute, I'm going to go back. I thought I had three examples. Developer issues, architectural control issues. Well, I guess I left out a slide. All right. So we're getting close to the end here. Uh, it's about 1246. So that should allow for, for, for some uh, questioning. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, final thoughts here. Why, why is this duty so high? Well, hello. You have got significant power over other people's property and their money. You know, essentially in the HOA setting, the owners really have a voice only on a couple of occasions. One is when they vote for you or against you. And the other is if they can all get together to override the budget that you did by a supermajority, right, to, to, to veto the budget, then they can stop that particular budget. But everything else is kind of sitting with you. So it is a responsibility and it should be taken seriously. How do you do it? Again, I gave you some some points, things, you know, to talk about this is a book. You must read it. It's a really good one. Well, it may not be a good book, but you must read it. The Declaration, CCNR is what some people refer to. You have to know that you cannot be clueless about what the assessment provisions or special assessment provisions or architectural control provisions are. You must be aware of what that declaration says. You don't have to memorize it. You don't have to know all the legalese, but you have to have read it. You have to have some familiarity. Similarly, if there's separate architectural guidelines and you're involved in that part of it, you need to know it. So must reads in terms of procedure, internally, how you have meetings, what you can do, owners meetings, board meetings, that sort of thing. The, the sort of the administrative part of how the show is run is in the bylaws. You need to know about that. The mandatory governance policies, there's several of them that are required for meetings, conflicts of interest, collections, etc. You need to know those. And you need to follow them. And actually, a lot of the mandatory governance policies about how to conduct, conduct a meeting, they can be extremely helpful about how to get through one of these situations. So you do fulfill your fiduciary duty. So be familiar. Must reads on the dollar side, budgets, periodic financial reports and statements. You have to know this stuff. Uh, and then kind of the must do stuff you know, communicate. I think a lot of times, uh, a lot of the complaints that people have is they don't know why you made a decision. They don't even know if you made a decision. Be transparent. Get it out there. Communicate. Collaborate among the board. This is, again, don't be the lone ranger. Don't make decisions on your own. Make your decision as a group and document it with minutes. Collaborate with the manager. These managers know a heck of a lot more than you realize. They do other communities and they are a great resource. And then also with owners. I mean, there may be skilled owners who've got experience in this area. Uh, bring them in. Have them be on a committee. Again, involve the owners on these larger tasks. Have an have a, have a open forum. You don't have to make any decisions, but you can hear what people are thinking. And then the consultation part. That was in that statute that I mentioned before about you can rely upon outside vendors and consultants. So do that. All right. I am now going to turn it to the questions. Hang on a minute. i got to figure out how to do this. All right. If I click on this, you are currently sharing your screen. Well, I don't see any questions. There we go. Okay. I have them. 
All right. I'll, let's see. It's about 1249. I think I'm at the top. To what extent may a board member discuss previous ACC issues with committee members or HOA members? A member is publicly discussing. Oh, that was another participant's question. Excuse me. Hang on a minute. That, the, the whole question did not show. Okay. To what extent may a board member discuss previous ACC issues with committee members or HOA members? A member is publicly discussing what he believes to has occurred as a truth. How much information can I give to clarify the situation and explain that we acted in good faith? That's an interesting question. There's a certain level of privacy within Kiowa about the architectural plans that may have been submitted by a unit owner. The idea is you don't want to have uh, copyrighted architectural plans or privacy invasions. But yes, you can justify what your decision is. Where it really it gets dicey is things, issues about collections or foreclosures, right? There's, there's, yeah, there's a Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and privacy considerations there. But I think it is appropriate to discuss with committee members or HOA members why a decision is made. I think it's probably best to start with a written discussion, maybe send a letter to that person who's complaining. I'm sorry, you may want more of an answer. Let me do this. There's my email on the last slide. And then there's also my phone number, which is 303-991-2030. If I don't get to everyone's questions or we need more, uh, get back to me. I'm going to go to the next question here. What if your management company doesn't follow through with decisions made by the board? Is that the end of the question? Yeah, that's not good. So the board of directors is the decision maker and is the authority for the association. The management company is a hired consultant to implement, to execute, to follow through and carry out the decisions made by the board. If they are not following through with them, then you need to have sort of a, a, a conversation and or a letter and or a meeting and or you terminate them because they are supposed to follow your decisions and not the other way around. Is there any guidance or requirement for hiring someone to inspect common area completion? Hang on a minute. The screen jumped. Sorry, I was halfway through a question and the whole, here it is, and it jumped. The, the whole screen just moved on me. I apologize. Here we go. Is there any guidance or requirement for hiring someone to inspect common area completion? What type of documentation should come out of the inspection? Is the HOA solely responsible for the cost of the inspection? And then does Altitude have any recommended services? So I think what the uh, question stems from is that um, topic about transition and developer control and, and inspecting whether the developer did properly complete the common area. Again, the first thing to do is there are certain documents that have to be turned over by the developer to the association. That would include plans and specifications, maybe the name of the vendor uh, or, or the contracts or warranties for say sidewalks or that sort of thing. I think the first thing you do is you go to the, the person who actually installed the sidewalk and see if, if they feel that the sidewalk was properly done or whatever it is, the pavement or the decks. The next thing is to hire an independent engineer to look at something if you don't get cooperation from the actual vendor or you don't have the warranty documents or you're seeing signs that there is a problem with how things were constructed. But yes, the cost of that inspection would be at the association's expense. All right, lots of questions here. Um, again, 303-991-2030. Be short at altitude.law. All right. Next question. To what extent can the board make violation, quote, summary, close quote, information available? They are proposing to post the violation summaries monthly slash quarterly with the amounts of each violation. Previously, as I would advise, they should just disclose the amount of letters sent and educate on the most frequent violations. They are opposing and requesting to display actual numbers. What would be the best practice or the best way to inform the members of violations taking place within their community? Well, number one is one. Sorry. Number one is that you should have a covenant enforcement policy. 
enforcement policy in effect. That's one of the mandatory policies. I would shy away towards alleged violations until it's been established as such. I mean, clearly, if you're talking about collections, there's all sorts of privacy considerations. You can't be disclosing to third parties what's going on about how much someone owes or what you're going to do. On the covenant violation side of things, yeah, I think there is a reasonable amount of information that the community is entitled to have about how many violations they are. And again, is it a violation or is it a claim violation? Are you working through it or not? If you can avoid it, I don't think you necessarily want to have names, so to speak, of unit owners because they may feel that you're disrespecting someone who's got a legitimate dispute with the um, association. That's a tough one to respond to in the abstract, and I apologize for that uh, follow-up. I mean, certainly the community is entitled to know as a whole, if there's a lot of violations or there's very few, or if there's one that's gone to court. I mean, I think, you know, if you're starting to spend money on a covenant enforcement action, you can tell the community you're spending money on a covenant enforcement action. I don't think you need to get down into the weeds on it. All right. Um, should, hang on a minute. I got the first part of this question, but not the rest of it. Should managers be absorbing and doing the board members' duties, president, secretary, treasurer, et cetera? Answer, no. This is the flip side of, you know, that question before, the manager's not carrying out the decisions of the board. Well, time to get a new manager or a council that manager. <laughs> the managers are hired consultants. And your responsibility and your protection and fulfilling your fiduciary duties is following the legitimate decisions of the board as a whole. You could be assisting the board. For example, the treasurer may ask you to print out a certain report or to summarize some of the expenses. Uh, the, you may be, as a manager, this happens a lot, drafting the minutes, which would be the secretary's job. But the secretary's got to go look at those minutes and ultimately has to approve them. So I'm not sure if that's entirely helpful. Again, that's hard in the abstract to answer. But managers are to execute the decisions of the board and to support the board in their decisions. All right. Hang on a second. We have lots of questions here. What time is it? 12.57. And we can go a little after one, I'm told. Is there any regulation or licensing of HOA companies and manager now? Good question. No, uh, that may come back. Essentially, the uh, uh, the licensing sunsetted and then COVID happened. Uh, I think Polis and the legislature, and I may be a little wrong on this, but I think they came up with we're going to study this and get back to it. I predict with the change of administration that there will be, once they get through all the COVID mess, uh, a resumption of the manager licensing probably this year, if not next. And they'd probably, uh, you know, delay it a half a year or, or part of a year. But that's a that's a good question. Whether you're licensed or not, though, doesn't stop best practices, right? And whether you're licensed or not doesn't mean you have or haven't fulfilled your fiduciary duties. There's all that hard work of getting it done every day. All right, hang on a minute. I'm trying to get to some more of these questions. If I am asked by the board to ignore a process or policy, such as giving violations for trash cans, for a certain period of time. Do I follow the direction of the board or do I follow the covenants which state trash cans may not be visible or do I follow the direction from the board? You know, I'll give a classic example where this comes up is like holiday lighting, right? That, that technically the lights on the wall may be a violation, but you know, you, you, it's the holidays, you give it a little bit of time, it's a violation, but are you gonna come in like, covenant enforcement Nazis and do it the next day? No, I don't think you have to do that. The trash cans, okay, it may say that they may not, it says may not be visible. Does it say shall not be visible? That's that discretionary mandatory part. Does it say should not be visible? If you are being directed as a manager by the board of directors to literally ignore a policy or ignore something in the covenants, I think the pushback initially verbally is, well, I don't think I'm allowed to do that because it's a shall thing in the covenants. If 
they insist upon that. I think you put something in writing that says, I believe that the board of directors, if you look at this section here, must go ahead and do this. I also think there's a rule of reason here, which is if there's a trash can out for two days, are you really going to start a covenant enforcement action? Can it can it slide for a day or so? And I think the answer is yes. But if you're really being told to ignore on a permanent basis something that is mandatory, I think you need to bring that to the board's attention and say, I can't in good faith fulfill my duties because I'm I am obliged as the manager. Yeah, I my contract's with you, but I can't just completely disregard something that's mandatory. Uh, maybe you need a new manager. All right. Management company refuses to say how many managers they have, won't give name of accountant or bookkeeper, has operated for more than 10 years from a post office box, sends insulting replies to HOA members' questions. Red flags, all caps. Yeah, red flags, all caps. Uh, it continues. Director of eight excuse me directors of hoa stuck in tight contract fail to do due diligence when contracting can complaints be made where will legislature reconsider licensing of hoa managers i already hit that i believe i believe there's something in kiowa that provides that a management contract cannot be more than one year don't quote me on that um, i think you can get out of that and I think that if you've got a situation where they won't be cooperating with you and you've tried, it may be time to get a new management company. That Yes, those are definite red flags. And I know that 99% of you managers that are on the line are not that management company. All right. It's 101. I don't know if any of you are getting cut off. I think I can go a few minutes longer. Uh, again, you got my email. You got my phone number. Uh, here's one. Situation. HOA treasurer, an experienced business owner, moves for an audit due to confusing financial information and lack of information from management company. Rest of board votes against, presumably the audit, due to the fear of cost. Management company drops HOA immediately but provides, quote, notice allotment time. I don't know what that means. Rest of board believes treasurer has insulted company. Declaration established for 250 members says nothing about audits and board has lots of dollars. Well, this is an interesting question, okay? So if you are that HOA treasurer, presumably a board member, and you're curious about those finances, and that treasurer, that board member has brought to the board a proposition, a motion to have an audit, because you think it's a good idea and you get voted down, that's the decision of the board. Make sure the minutes note that HOA treasurer board member voted for this and then the vote failed and have each board member's name associated with whether you were for or against the audit. Then if things go horribly south later on, you can say, I fulfilled my fiduciary duty. I was looking for an audit and I got outvoted by the other board members. Now, that's a discretionary decision because if there's no mandatory audit, the board can maybe legitimately decide to not go ahead and get an audit. But if the information that's in the question where the management company is apparently providing confusing financial information or a lack of information, why should this board be relying upon the information it's getting from the management company? Those board members may not be acting reasonably because they don't have a proper information and they have reason to believe the information is not reliable. Sadly, there are occasions where there are instances where management companies have not acted responsibly with respect to funds. Time to dig deeper or get another management company. All right, you are not alone. Can a board rely on a property manager in the same manager as le in the same manner? Excuse me, as legal counsel, public accountant, providing li reliable information concerning financials, record keeping, etc. Yes, if I mean that's why you hire those management companies in the first place because you had some reason to believe that they were competent. And as you work with that community manager, if you continue to believe they are competent and reliable, yes. You can rely upon them. That does not excuse you looking at the governing documents. That does not excuse you reading those financial statements and having some level of understanding. But in contrast to the previous example where there's a lot of 
signs that the management company is not being responsible if the manager has shown they're responsive and reliable and competent and accurate yes you can rely upon them all right 104 hang on a second i'm having a hard time moving the cursor i apologize Oh, we may have been cut off because there it goes. Does a board member have a, a fiduciary duty to their other board members to behave responsibly in the HOA community and not undermine the board to the residents of the community? Absolutely. This gets back to that duty of loyalty and duty of obedience. And this also gets back to that notion of you don't want lone rangers, you act as a group. Um, if there is a board member that is out there castigating the other board members or undermining the decisions, the first instance, I think, at a board meeting, you have the other board members have a dialogue with that board member. Look, look Joseph or Josephine, you're out there and you're kind of we're hearing that you're saying this, that or the other thing to undermine our decisions. What's your response? Maybe there's a good reason, but if there's not, it's like, well, are you the best person to be on this board? If you're not in support of these decisions, it's okay to not be unanimous. You may be against it, but once we've made a decision, that's our decision as an organization. You have to support that. There's um, a, one of the policies, uh, the mandatory governance policies that exists in Kiowa is the one about conflicts of interest. So if a board member has a conflict of interest, what's to be done about it. And generally what they're supposed to do is abstain and not participate in those decisions. Let's say you've got a painting contract and you're thinking of hiring the painting company that the board member owns. Well, that board member should not participate in those decisions. But to this point where there's a board member that's out there and personally is going against the board's decisions, you show that board member the conflict of interest policy and have a discussion with him or her. Do you think you have a conflict of interest here? Maybe you shouldn't be participating either in this decision or on this board because you're conflicted. You want to pursue your own agenda. You could pursue your own agenda, but maybe not as a board member because we act as a group, not as a Lone Ranger. All right. I am having great difficulty moving the cursor to get more questions. Let me go back up. Oh, someone said thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Um, I think we've gotten most of them, and I think it's about 110. Let me see if I can do any more. I expect some of you are dropping off. I think we got all the questions here, folks. Wow. <laughs> Again, uh, telephone number 303-991-2030. Email bshortaltitude.law. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope it was a little bit helpful. Make it a great day.